Sounds good, Nikki. All right, if we are all ready, welcome, welcome, good evening, and happy Earth Day. On behalf of Bloomington Sustainability Commission and the League of Women Voters Bloomington, I'm pleased to welcome you to our virtual celebration of Earth Day 2021. Before I introduce myself and the MC alongside me, I would like to recognize George Floyd, Dante Wright, our Bloomington Indigenous tribes and BIPOC communities as we embrace community building through our Earth Day initiatives today. Thank you very much. I would like to introduce first alongside me, MC Tim Sandry, Chair of the Bloomington Sustainability Commission. And I am Nikki Marie Kohler, President of the League of Women Voters Bloomington. We are so glad that this group of people can come together tonight and thank you so much sincerely for joining us. So every year on April 22nd, Earth Day marks the anniversary of humanity's modern environmental movement. In 1970, groups that have been fighting individually against oil spills, uh, polluting factories, toxic dumps, pesticides, the loss of wilderness and the extinction of wildlife united on the first Earth Day around the shared value of protecting our planet. By the end of 1970, the first Earth Day led to the creation of the United States Environmental Protection Agency and the passage of other first of their kind environmental laws, including the National Environmental Education Act, the Occupational Safety and Health Act, the Clean Air Act, and the Clean Water Act. These laws have protected millions of men, women, and children from disease and death and have protected hundreds of species from extinction. Today, Earth Day is widely recognized as the largest secular observance in the world, marked by more than a billion people every year as a day of action to change human behavior and create global, national, and local policy change. This year, our organizations have chosen a theme of discovering opportunities to explore, protect, and restore Bloomington's natural treasures. Bloomington is fortunate to be rich in parks and natural areas. These gems in our midst provide a multitude of benefits, including adding to our biodiversity, reducing pollution, improving water quality, mitigating the effects of global warming and improving our quality of life by bringing people together. Tonight, we hope to acquaint you with a few of these special places and inspire, inspire you to see, protect and restore these natural areas in Bloomington. We have some great speakers for you this evening and a few fun activities mixed in. So we hope you will enjoy our celebration of Earth Day. Okay, a few housekeeping notes. We'll be recording the celebration to share with those that who are not able to join us this evening. And we also ask that you utilize the chat feature located at the bottom of your screen if you have any questions or need assistance. Our first speaker this evening uh, is uh, Mayor Bloomington's Mayor Tim Bussey. Uh, mayor Bussey was first sworn in as the 13th mayor of the city of Bloomington on January 2nd, 2020 and was the city's first new mayor in two decades. He was initially appointed to the Bloomington City Council in April of 2011 and was reelected twice and served two four-year terms as a council member at large. As mayor, Tim's top priorities have included the Bloomington business community, transportation, and the strategic alignment of all that Bloomington has to offer. He also serves as vice president of the Bloomington Port Authority and has served on the boards of the Bloomington Chamber of Commerce, the Minnesota Valley chapter, the Isaac Walton League and Bloomington Heritage Days. He and his wife, Heather, have two grown children and live in the Southbrook neighborhood of Bloomington with their dogs, Jake and Elwood. Uh, I'll now turn it over to Mayor Bussey to say a few words to kick off tonight's celebration. Mayor Bussey. Thank you so very much, Tim. Thank you, Nikki. Thanks for that welcome, Tim. And I appreciate also mentioning that I was sworn in on January 2nd. Thank you for not mentioning that by 
uh, St. Patrick's Day of that same year, the world had basically gone to heck in a handcart. <laughs> I don't think it's related, but I can't say for certain that it doesn't work out that way. So, but thank you. Thank you for that nice introduction. Hello, all, and welcome. Thank you so very much for joining us this evening for our City of Bloomington celebration of Earth Day 2021. I think it's terrific. It's just fantastic that our community comes together every year to observe this important day and to actually recommit ourselves to this incredibly important effort that we have in front of us. I wanna thank the members of the Bloomington Sustainability Commission for their work on tonight's program and for your ongoing work and your dedicated service to the city of Bloomington. Thank you so very much. Also wanna thank the Bloomington League of Women Voters. What an outstanding organization. I mean, they, they very simply, the League of Women Voters is always just doing good and we greatly appreciate it. Thanks much for your work on this for your ongoing work on the myriad of other issues that you're involved with. And finally, I wanna thank everyone else for taking their time to be part of tonight's event. It's a beautiful Thursday evening. We were talking earlier, we haven't had a whole lot of these. You could be anywhere else, but you choose to be here. And I appreciate that. That says a lot about your commitment to your community and your commitment to this important topic. So as Tim said, this year's Earth Day theme here in Bloomington is discovering opportunities to explore, protect and restore Bloomington's natural treasures. Personally, I observed Earth Day earlier today by taking advantage of the beautiful day and I ducked out for a couple of hours to clean up my perennial garden. Now, I know it's not exactly quite on theme, but for me, when I see that garden literally buzzing with activity all summer long and I see those pollinators working on the bee balm and the lavender and the cone flowers and the black eyed Susans and the sunflowers, that to me is working to protect one of Bloomington's natural treasures. I've even learned to tolerate milkweed for the butterflies. So I, 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 I try to work hard with, that was, that was how I was personally involved with Earth Day today. But the theme is particularly timely this year since Bloomington is currently in the process of our updating our park system master plan and the city council has added enhancing natural resources to our strategic priorities as an area of focus this year. Now, the purpose of a park system master plan is to establish a clear, 20 year vision for the parks, the trails, the recreation areas and all the open spaces in Bloomington. And folks, that is not an insignificant job. So a couple of quick facts for you. Did you realize that there are more than 9,000 acres of parkland and open space in Bloomington of which almost 3,000 acres are city owned? Did you know that Bloomington is blessed to have 97 parks and more than 40 miles of off-road trails? And did you know that nearly 36% of the city's 38 square miles is either parkland or open space. Now, those are amazing stats and, and they speak to the high value that the residents of Bloomington have placed on green spaces and natural resource areas. In fact, natural areas are consistently at the top of any list of characteristics that contribute to Bloomington's high quality of life. Community engagement for the Park System Master Plan asked participants to rate their top priorities and themes and natural resources and environmental sustainability and resiliency were the top two themes identified. And that's why the park system plan will place an increased emphasis on natural resource management and sustainability. And that's also why the city council has added enhancing natural resources to our strategic priorities. When, when we met as a council earlier this year to talk about priorities, we talked quite a bit about the importance of our natural resources and, and the role that they play in our community. We talked about how residents are drawn to natural resources. We talked about how natural areas add to property values and provide some really pretty unique recreational opportunities that are frankly hard to find in other parts of the metro area. And we talked about how Bloomington's natural resources are part of what makes this community very special. The council has made a commitment to place a greater emphasis on maintaining and restoring our natural areas. And we are going to promote that importance within our community and beyond. Tonight, we're gonna to hear about a number of these natural treasures I'm pretty sure I'm preaching to a good portion of the choir here, but I would really encourage you to get out and explore some of these special spots. And I really hope you've got plans for Saturday to join in one of the activities that are, that are planned across the community to help protect and restore our natural treasures. And if you can't join on Saturday, that's fine too. I trust you. I mean, if you're here tonight, I trust that you'll find your own way to make an impact either large or small. So to the surprise of no one, I've been, I've been watching and Earth Day has been trending number one on Twitter all day. And after spending too much time actually reading the tweets, I, I learned some things that I didn't know about Earth Day. And Tim actually mentioned one of them, or maybe Nikki mentioned that. I learned that Earth Day is recognized as the largest secular celebration in the world with more than a billion people participating in some way. 
I learned that the phrase Earth Day was coined by a guy named Julian Koenig, who was an ad copywriter who also worked on the iconic Think Small campaign for Volkswagen. I'm old enough to remember the Think Small campaign for Volkswagen. He worked on that. And Koenig said that he picked the words Earth Day because it sounded like birthday, which ironically today would have been for Julian Koenig. He would have been 100 years old today. I learned that the original Earth Day in 1970 remains as the largest single day of protest in history. I was five years old at the time. I'll be honest, I don't remember it. If you do, put a note in the chat. It would it'd be fun to see who here remembers or possibly even took part in that original Earth Day. I also learned on Twitter that on this day in 2001, the movie Shrek was released. And the celebration of that event, I believe, is the second largest secular celebration worldwide. But then, you know, I thought more about the original Earth Day being the largest single day of protest in history. And Tim talked about this in a little, a little bit. You know, I, I thought about how back in 1970, people across the country, frustrated by years of inaction and frankly, frightened by the conditions of the world around them, they spoke with one voice. They demanded change. Groups that had been fighting individually to protect water and wildlife groups that have been working in their own cities and their own states to raise awareness and to change public policy, people who were ambivalent to the issue or who were happy to just sit on the fence and not get involved, people who just didn't care, they all came together on that first Earth Day. They came together on college campuses and in cities and in towns to say that we can do better. We've absolutely got to do better. And their commitment led to change across the United States and eventually across the globe. Now, personally, I can't help but see the parallels between that first Earth Day and the national call for change that we've seen over the past 11 months. It gives me hope that we have a template in place for long-term success. So happy Earth Day to all of you. Thanks one again, once again to the Bloomington Sustainability Commission and to the Bloomington League of Women Voters for your work on this evening's program. Thanks to you all for being here. Unfortunately, I can't stay. I had another meeting that started 12 minutes ago. I told them I'd be a little bit late, but I'd, I'd jump on just as soon as possible. So I'm gonna say once again, thanks for being here. Happy Earth Day to all. I'm gonna turn it back over to Tim and Nikki. Tell you all, have a great evening. Thank you, Mayor Bussey. It's great that our city has a mayor and a council that is that are committed to our natural areas to such an extent it really bodes well for our future so now we're going to move on to the first of our fun activities for the evening lois norgard a bloomington league member will quiz you on a few of our natural spaces open spaces in bloomington so lois take it away yeah thanks tim um yeah, we are going to show you just a few images of some of the beautiful parks, the 97 different parks we have in Bloomington that the Mayor Bussey just um, mentioned, but you will try to name that park. So we'll have a little poll. If you can guess the name or if you recognize the park, please do um, respond to the poll and we'll tell you what the name is afterwards. But a little teaser for some of the programs or presentations that we're gonna have in a little bit here. But yeah, please join this first image and let us know what you think it is. Okay, I'm seeing that 19 of 24 have voted. So we'll give it a few more seconds. Okay, I'm going to end polling and show the results. Lois, do they have it correct? That is correct. Highland Hills. You guys, you guys knew this one really well. It was a good iconic image of, of what we have at that park. Some of them won't be quite so easy. Let's move on to the next image. Okay. Hold on one second. 
And here is poll number two. What a beautiful green park we have here. We'll give it about five more seconds and I'll now end the poll. And here are the results. How did people do this time, Lois? Uh, this one, we had uh, only 18% uh, get it right. It was Harrison. This is Harrison Picnic Grounds or Harrison Park. Um, a beautiful place with a lot of great uh, paved trails like this. Thanks so oh. much. Pat on your back if you got that one right. <laughs> you may have been there. Yes. Let's move to the next image. This one's going to be a little harder. Um, I don't know if people will recognize the blood root that you have there, where that might be found. It is trickier with the close-up image. Yes, I wanted to show some of the really beautiful natural areas we have, as well as some of the iconic landmark type images. <laughs> so, Okay, we'll give it a few more seconds. Okay, I'm going to end polling and share the results. And the people who picked Moyer Central Park have the right park. That's that's where you find these particular bloodroot flowers. Thanks nice. so much. Let's move to the next. Answers are coming in. We'll give it a few more seconds. Okay, I'm gonna end polling and here are the results. And a lot of people picked that one right. Pond Dakota Mission Park. That's the park where we have the a lot of the history programming for the history of Bloomington. Thanks so much for participating, folks. We'll move on to some of these wonderful programs you're gonna hear, but we'll do another poll in a little while. There's all your images and the names of those parks. Please make time to try to explore the parks of Bloomington. Thanks so much, I'll hand it back. Oh, you can hear me, right? IT. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I'm unmuted. <laughs> Thanks so much, Lois. That was super fun. Um, all right, we're really excited to welcome our next speaker, Serena Selbo, oh. Refuge Manager for the Minnesota Valley National Wildlife Refuge. So Serena has a Bachelor of Science from the University of North Dakota in Biology and Chemistry and a Master of Science from Ohio State in Ecology and Evolution. Serena has worked for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for 19 years at the field, regional, and national level. She's held positions in Ohio, Colorado, D.C., and Alaska prior to becoming the manager at Minnesota Valley National Wildlife Refuge. Throughout her career, she has focused on science-based decision-making planning at landscape scales, and connecting people with nature. She is currently very involved with the field of urban ecology, mentoring future conservation leaders, and providing welcoming experiences to new refuge visitors. Thank you so much for joining us, Serena. Welcome. Thank you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. All right. Very good. 
Um, well, I just want to take a minute and thank the Bloomington Sustainability Commission, as well as the League of Women Voters Bloomington for inviting me tonight. Um, I'm really excited to, to join you and celebrate Earth Day this year. Um, maybe someday we'll, we'll do things back in person, but um, I have to say um, I'm impressed with the program you guys have pulled off and have given us the opportunity to connect uh, virtually this evening. So tonight I'm going to spend a little bit of time um, talking to you about a wonderful treasure right in your backyard in Bloomington. Uh, next slide, please. So Minnesota Valley National Wildlife Refuge is a thriving urban refuge where nature connects people and wildlife. Next slide. Minnesota Valley was established in 1976. And I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about the history because it's a little unique in um, the suite of refuges that we have nationally. Minnesota Valley was really a grassroots effort where the local community came together when they saw a lot of um, industrial development happening in the lower Minnesota River Valley and were concerned about the future of this beautiful green space. And working closely together and with the Fish and Wildlife Service and um, important congressional representatives, including Walter Mondale, um, who just passed away, um, they were able to get this brand new refuge established right here in the heart of the Twin Cities in an urban area. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about how special that is. Minnesota Valley um, is administered by the US Fish and Wildlife Service, which is the agency that I work for. Um, we are housed in the Department of Interior, um, a federal agency that also houses the National Park Service, Bureau of Land Management, Bureau of Indian Affairs, and other land managing agencies that you might be familiar with. The US Fish and Wildlife Service oversees the National Wildlife Refuge System, which is a series of lands and waters throughout the nation, 568 national wildlife refuges, in fact. Um, you can find one in at least every state. Um, national wildlife refuges are unique spaces in our country because they're set aside for wildlife first, but also for the opportunities for people to enjoy those wildlife. So often it is wildlife dependent recreation. Um, at Minnesota Valley, we have lots of trails. We have opportunities for hunting and fishing, kayaking, biking. We even allow dogs if they're on leash, snowshoeing in the winter and photography. I could go on and on many opportunities for outdoor recreation at Minnesota Valley. Um, like I mentioned, we're an urban refuge and we were born urban. Uh, we are one of the largest urban refuges in the country. And that provides a uniqueness for us to connect people with the outdoors in uh, an important role for our refuge to do that and, and help other refuges across the country meet those needs as well. We are also complexed with the Minnesota Valley Wetland Management District which is a 14 county area and administers the waterfowl production areas. So we cover a huge chunk <laughs> um, of this part of the state. Um, about 26,000 acres is managed under the complex. Um, the refuge proper is about 70 miles along the Minnesota River. From Henderson um, up to Bloomington, we um, go right up to the edge of Fort Snelling. Uh, and very close to the Minneapolis International Airport. Um, we have about 45 miles of trail that are scattered along those river bottoms. And we have two visitor and education center, one located just outside of Carver at Rapids Lake and one located in Bloomington, which I will talk to you a little bit more about tonight. Next slide, please. 
Diverse habitats support a variety of wildlife species and Minnesota Valley is no exception. We are very, very lucky to steward so much diversity at this refuge in the backyard of skyscrapers. Next slide, please. I'm gonna share a little bit of the types of habitats that we have at Minnesota Valley and um, talk about some of the uniquenesses. So the refuge you can see from these pictures, I'm sharing four different of the major habitats that we have. And that includes floodplain forest, tall grass prairie, wetlands, and oak savanna. Um, some of these you're probably very familiar with. Um, the floodplain forest is what you will see along the river bottoms, along the Minnesota River. That's where you find giant cottonwood trees. Um, and this is a, a very dynamic ecosystem that often floods. Um, we are really fortunate to have public lands along the Minnesota River here in this part of the world, because without that, that flooding would likely be much worse. <laughs> Um, the floodplain forests play a very important ecological role in cleaning um, our water as well as storing it. We also have tall grass prairie, which is a habitat that provides a, a lot of opportunity for pollinators and for songbirds, um, other types of wildlife as well. Um, it's a, a beautiful, beautiful habitat that you really need to kind of walk through and explore to understand all the diversity. Wetlands, we have numerous wetlands um, on the refuge, then lots of waterfowl habitat. Um, the wetlands um, play a very important ecological role in this part of the world. And then I wanted to chat with you a little bit about oak savanna. Um, oak savanna is my favorite habitat on the refuge. It is very, very rare. There is um, not, um, I, I believe what I heard the most recently was less than 1% of the original oak savanna remains. And oak savanna is a habitat that is um, comprised of large um, oak trees, often bur oak, and then grasses underneath. So it's this kind of scattered, um, forested, grassy habitat, and a lot of very unique species occur in it, including woodpeckers. Next slide, please. And of course, like every good National Wildlife Refuge, we have iconic wildlife, um, including bald eagles, river otters, turkeys, and numerous birds, shorebirds, wading birds, waterfowl, and songbirds, migratory birds. Next slide. So a couple of years ago at Minnesota Valley, we developed a new visitor services plan. And this was really an opportunity for us to think about what we wanted our visitors to experience and how we wanted to connect with our community. And it's really important for us um, because we are an urban refuge um, to listen to the community, see what their needs are and, and help them experience the refuge in the way that's meaningful to them. So at Minnesota Valley National Wildlife, refuge, we want to welcome our community through connections that are meaningful, provide educational opportunities and recreational experiences, while also conserving that wildlife habitat that I just talked to you about in this Minnesota River Valley. I'm going to speak about three areas of focus um, that, and priorities that we have at the refuge, and those are being a community asset, providing stepping stones of engagement, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, and training the next generation of conservation leaders. Next slide, please. So being a community asset. Um, one of the things that is really important in connecting with diverse communities and, whoa, my light went off, and underserved communities, is that all of our programming is free. Our events are free, our facilities are free, our parking is free. Everything that we provide at Minnesota Valley is free. We have um, spaces for gathering, we have classroom space, auditorium space. We can 
have, um, have wonderful large events um, and we can teach the children in the community. Um, we feel like being a community asset is, is a, an important role and we serve the community by providing facilities and opportunities um, for, for the community um, here in the Twin Cities. Next slide, please. The second focus area for us is what we term stepping stones of engagement. And essentially what that means is that we want to um, provide opportunities to engage people and get them comfortable in being in a national wildlife refuge. And what we have found is that you need to start in people's own backyards. You need to start where they are, where their events are, where the opportunities they feel comfortable being. And then you have the opportunity to engage with them on maybe some new things or provide them some opportunities they haven't had to explore before. So one way we do this is through our outreach program. And one of the, the greatest tools in our toolbox is our outreach trailer shown here in this picture, where we are able to um, fill it with all sorts of fun recreation um, experiences, including uh, fishing rods, nets for insect collection, uh, binoculars for bird watching, snowshoes in the winter. And we fill the trailer with all these great things. And we go out into the community and provide opportunities for local residents to engage in their own neighborhoods, in their own parks. Um, and we get out there and we see what they're interested in doing and we provide kind of that, that sometimes for folks that first step, um, that first stepping stone of, of engaging with nature and the outdoors. When people get more comfortable, um, you know, doing outdoor um, recreation in their neighborhoods, then they may want to come to Minnesota Valley and recreate in an area that to them may have felt less welcome initially or a little scary or a little too wild. And so we can provide them these kind of stepping stones to help folks get engaged. Um, another, because this is really hard to do during COVID, uh, we were really, really fortunate to have some virtual um, engagement opportunities during the last year. And I am super, super, super um, blessed to have a very creative staff. Um, my team thinks outside the box all the time and develops some great um, virtual content that we were able to share, not only with the, the children and the schools that we serve through our environmental education program, but also through outreach. And the backyard, um, Nature in Your Backyard backpack program was born out of that. And this backpack is filled with all sorts of fun things that you can do right in your own backyard or right at your local green space in your local park. And we're providing these to underserved communities, working closely with neighborhood libraries to get those backpacks in the hands of families so that they can explore nature. And then also join this club with us and have that connection um, where we provide them then seasonal updates, um, new things for the backpack and um, new educational information on a, on a continuous basis. Next slide, please. And then the final priority and focus area for us I wanted to chat with you about um, is training the next generation of conservation leaders. It's critically important uh, for us to be thinking ahead um, about the future of conservation to make sure that we maintain a conservation ethic. Um, we, we do a really good job with little kids and getting them excited about being outdoors. We also need to continue to provide that pipeline of opportunity. So at Minnesota Valley, we've been focusing on internships and mentoring opportunities for high school youth, as well as college students and beyond. 
And we focus on, on training that next generation, getting folks excited about working in a land management agency, giving them the opportunities here that then they can maybe take and work in other agencies and other places throughout the country, or maybe we can keep them, which I'd love to keep them all, but I don't have the budget for that. Um, so training the next generation is a, is a really um, important um, aspect. And it's something that our team takes very seriously and mentoring uh, young people and getting them excited about careers in conservation. Next slide, please. So the next part of this talk, I want to share with you three of our great hotspots right in your backyard, right in Bloomington. And I'm guessing many of you know these places already, but um, it's always nice to look at some pretty pictures. So I'm gonna uh, talk with you about our Bloomington Education and Visitor Center. I'm gonna talk about Bass Ponds, and then lastly, Old Cedar. Next slide. So the Bloomington um, Education and Visitor Center is located you know, right at the end of American Boulevard, um, you know, close to the, to the interstate and the airport. Uh, we are um, uh, actually closed currently during COVID, but all of our outdoor spaces, our trailheads, parking lots are open, our trails, all of, everything has been open, and we are doing outdoor um, uh, programming as well. So there's still plenty to do if you show up at the Bloomington Visitor Center. Um, like I said, everything is free. That's very important to us. Um, one of the uh, things that you can do at the Bloomington Visitor Center is access many of our trails. And the Hillside Loop Trail is kind of a nice short, shorter trail which um, culminates in this beautiful overlook right on the back side of the visitor center. Um, the, one of the great things about this overlook is that it really gives you a true cross section of the different habitats that we have at Minnesota Valley, where it's coming up from the river bottoms and the lakes and wetlands, and then into the floodplain forest, the oak savanna working its way then up into prairie. Um, and it's a beautiful location year around. It's easy to forget sometimes you're in the city. Um, this time of year, I would encourage you to keep your eye out for spring wildflowers. They're very ephemeral, they don't last very long. Uh, so get out there now. Um, the picture on the bottom there, that's a blood root, which uh, Lois also showed us in mass earlier. Um, one of those beautiful wildflowers you can see this time of year. We have lots of iconic wildlife uh, at, at the Bloomington Visitor Center. You'll always see a turkey. I can almost guarantee it. Uh, lots of turkeys hanging around. Um, we also have, have um, uh, winter activities and um, we provide free snowshoe lending from the Bloomington Visitor Center. Uh, it's also a key part of our environmental education program with the, with the classrooms, as you can see from the, the group of kids in this photo. And then finally, I wanted to mention a new venture that we've undertaken um, over the last year in partnership with Artistry based in Bloomington. We have um, reinvigorated a, a space in the visitor center into um, a really blossoming gallery that focuses on local artists that are connecting art and nature. And so we have a, the opportunity to provide the space for them to display their work, um, to teach about how um, they go through their creative process and to help connect our communities with nature and art together. And it's free, the you know, entrance to the gallery is free. Um, right now you can visit um, the artistry uh, website. I think it's, um, mnartistry.com or artistrymn.org, one of those. And you can link on the Confluence Gallery and see a beautiful exhibit by Jody Reeb, which uses, she uses acoustic paint, which is beeswax paint um, in her artwork. And it all has a, a nature theme. Next slide, please. 
The next spot I'm going to highlight along are the, the great spots in Bloomington is Bass Ponds. Next slide. So Bass Ponds is literally just blocks from the Mall of America and has the only native brook trout stream in the metro. It is a little treasure hidden. It, this cold water, clean stream bubbles out of the aquifer somewhere, we think, near the Mall of America. <laughs> and it is an absolute treasure. Um, you can go down there and see this babbling brook. Um, and the, the brook trout are these tiny native little trout that we work very closely with the DNR in monitoring. Um, no fishing of the trout allowed in, in, this, in this stream, this Ike's Creek, um, but we do have fishing at the Bass Ponds. So you have the opportunity to see this beautiful creek as well as walk along trails along several different ponds, of one of which is identified in the DNR fishing in your neighborhood, Finn, um, ponds as a stocked pond. So there's a, always great opportunities for, for uh, new anglers to get out there and try to snag a fish. Um, this year, we had the opportunity to upgrade some infrastructure out at Bass Ponds, including a bridge, a new fishing pier, as well as an observation platform. So I encourage you to get out there and check it out. Um, we also do um, duck banding based out of Bass Ponds and other locations on the refuge. So um, we actually are a science-based agency and we do you know, research and facilitate that right at Minnesota Valley as well. Next slide, please. The final location I wanna chat with you a little bit about today is Old Cedar. Next slide. So many of you are probably very familiar with Old Cedar and this is a, a great reminder for me to, to um, you know, acknowledge the importance of partnerships in all of our work. Um, Old Cedar is a really good example of a strong partnership with the city of Bloomington. Um, we have great shared spaces with the city down at Old Cedar. The bridge itself is owned by the city, but the refuge owns the land on either side. And we, um, we jointly manage the site, um, including this brand new way station um, that was just built down there. So I'm looking forward to to that facility being opened up and it's gonna be a great space for, for everyone to enjoy. Um, Old Cedar is um, a real um, great focal place for us at Minnesota Valley because you can get a little bit of everything down there. You can walk the bridge and see um, all sorts of waterfowl. Sometimes you may even see like beavers and otters um, right off of that old historic bridge. Um, we also have a boardwalk where you can walk out into the marsh um, and see those secretive uh, marsh birds and all sorts of songbirds. We have a trail that runs up the bluff um, from Old Cedar um, that connects with other trails um, down into the city of Bloomington and beautiful forest, lots of great wildflowers in that section of the trail this year. And then we have um, an area that we have been really focusing on the last couple of years to make more open and um, a little bit brighter and, and accessible to our public with this wide flat kind of crushed stone trail that's really great for wheelchairs and strollers. And we're focusing on families in this area as well through our brand new nature play area. If you're not familiar with Nature Play Area, I encourage you to, to get down there um, and check it out. But it's, it's, a, it's a great space to kind of encourage young people to get off the trail and to just play and to fall in love with nature through play and exploration. Um, they can climb on rocks and big logs. They can build forts with sticks. Um, there's all sorts of great little uh, little stopping spots along the way for, for kids to explore. 
We also have a free little library uh, housed there at the new nature play area, uh, which is filled with nature books. So I really uh, encourage folks to, to get down there as well. And we're planning um, an event uh, this year with the city of Bloomington um, to celebrate the grand reopening, I guess you would call it, of Old Cedar. Um, we had hoped to do that when the bridge was complete and with COVID, things got pushed off a little bit. So right now we're looking at um, probably the end of September. Um, very likely it'll be a little bit smaller in scale than maybe the, the celebration that we initially envisioned. But we do want to make sure we acknowledge the support in the community for Old Cedar um, and all the, the effort that went into making this place beautiful. Um, the luminaries too, I forgot to mention, uh, we did our first uh, luminary walk at Old Cedar um, this winter. And that was really great because people needed to get outside and it was something you could do safe and outdoors and socially distanced. And it was a beautiful full moon uh, night that folks got the opportunity to get out there and see the refuge in the dark. Next slide, please. Because it is Earth Day, I wanted to talk about the importance of stewardship and um, express my hope and desire that you will also um, find that that is valuable and think about volunteering. Um, Minnesota Valley, like many national wildlife refuges and parks and other um, green spaces, rely a lot on volunteers. They are our, our heart and our soul, our bread and our butter. Uh, we cannot do all of this work alone. I have over you know, 26,000 acres to manage with a staff of 30. Um, that is not a lot. <laughs> And uh, volunteers are our amazing resource for us. There's a lot of volunteer opportunities at Minnesota Valley. This slide highlights a few, including habitat restoration. We do a lot of invasive species control work on the refuge, uh, planting of native species. This picture highlights, uh, I think it was at Public Lands Day uh, two years ago, where we planted over 5,000 native prairie plants at Old Cedar. Uh, trash cleanup is a volunteer opportunity that we do every spring, um, sometimes more often. In fact, we're hoping that you come out and join us at Bass Ponds for a trash cleanup that we have planned for this Saturday. Um, please uh, sign up and, and come out and join us for that. Uh, seed collection is an activity that we can do in the fall with volunteers where we hand harvest prairie seed then that native seed then that we use to restore other sites on the refuge. Um, we also have volunteers that assist in visitor centers, welcoming um, folks and giving them information. We have volunteers that help with our environmental education programs um, with interpretation. We have volunteers that hike our trails and um, rove and range our trails for us. And that's a great opportunity, especially now during COVID, because you go out on your own time and you're kind of the eyes and the ears of the refuge. And you let us know uh, maybe what wildlife you're seeing and how many visitors you've encountered. And if there's some maintenance or, or management issues that you've encountered. So lots of great volunteer opportunities. Um, we also are just looking for people who are great photographers or interested in helping us with our um, Facebook and, and websites and, and things like that. Next slide, please. So I encourage you, being that it is Earth Day, to consider volunteering and, and not just on Earth Day. We need help all the time. And it's a, it's a great way to give back to the community right here in your backyard. So please uh, take down our website. And there's a lot of information on there. That's where you can find our trail maps, information about events and different programs. Um, we're also on Facebook. Uh, you can search for us on Facebook and you can find out um, all the latest and greatest as it's happening. So I am going to stop there and I just want to 
Um, again, thanks for your time and for celebrating Earth Day today. Um, I'm really hoping that you uh, maybe learn something new tonight and can come out and enjoy this treasure right in your backyard. Thank you so much, Serena. If anyone has any questions for her, feel free to throw them in the chat box and we can definitely connect um, further. But um, thank you so much, Serena. Uh, it's really great to hear about everything going on at Minnesota Valley. And I'm sure everyone will agree that we are truly lucky to have the refuge right here in our backyard. So thank you so much for your time. Um, yeah, and uh, let's see here. Next, we're going back to Lois for another pop quiz. Let's see how we do with this one. Another image for us to look at. So we'll pop up uh, some names of parks and you can choose which one you think this one is. Keep it open for a few more seconds. Final votes. Okay, we will close the poll. And here's what people thought. And the majority got it right. That is Central Park Moyer. So yeah, beautiful place with the stream through. So definitely make a make a plans to go explore that park. Let's move to the next image. Have a nice fall image now. Yeah, beautiful park. We're getting a wide mix of answers for this one. <laughs> There's a lot of guessing, I think, going on in this one. <laughs> I would be guessing too if I didn't see the answers. So. <laughs> We'll leave it open for a few more seconds to get the final votes in there. I'll end the poll and here are the results. Well, majority wins. That is Parker's Picnic Ground. So definitely a beautiful oak savanna that's being restored there. And that is a place we have an event on Saturday. So please come out and help us pick the garlic mustard out of the park. That's going on Saturday afternoon. Should we move to the next image? Number seven. The votes are coming in. We'll keep it open for about five more seconds. Okay. Japanese Garden. How did they do? Yep, that is correct. It's the majority got it. It's the Japanese gardens that we have. Beautiful place to visit by Normodale College. I think we have one more image to look at. Looks like many people are ending on a high note. Yes, that hey. is. The majority got that one too, Minnesota River Bottoms Trails. It's along the Minnesota River Valley there and watching the barges go through. And I just will have the four up again that everyone can kind of take a look at again and see the names. I want to say thank you so much for the photographers for our photos this evening. So that thank you so much to Nikki Fuller and also Rob Boutte. These are beautiful images of our parks that they have um, supplied for our little polls tonight. All right. <clears throat> Thanks, Lois. Yeah, you bet. These photos 
I mean, it just really inspires me to get out and explore the many natural areas in Bloomington that I have yet to visit. And there are so many that, you know, it's just, it's just hard to know how you can get to see them all, especially in their beauty as you've uh, uh, displayed here. And this uh, leads nicely into our next group of speakers. Uh, tonight, we have a trio of speakers who will go a bit deeper into a few of our Bloomington treasures and share more about how you can enjoy and help protect these valuable resources. Uh, first up is Bob Boutet. Uh, I'm sorry, Rob, <laughs> Rob Boutet. <laughs> Uh, Rob is a 19-year resident of the City of Bloomington. He serves on the Sustainability Commission, where his focus is on natural open spaces and climate change. As an ecologist and environmental consultant, he has over 30 years of experience in wetlands, wildlife, environmental assessment, and restoration. Uh, Rob is going to talk about Nine Mile Creek, which is one of Bloomington's most popular nat natural treasures. Uh, so, Rob, take it away. All right. Um, Nine Mile Creek, if you turn your attention to the uh, logo, incidentally, in the um, lower left corner, you'll see the 50th Earth Day celebration. That was last year. So oh, in the interest of sustainability, I recycled the uh, PowerPoint template. Next slide. So Nine Mile Creek uh, is actually composed of three different parks. It's uh, three parks in one. There's Moyer Park on the, towards the upper left. The very northern end is Harrison Park Picnic Ground. <clears throat> and then uh, the rest of it farther south is Central Park. And then when you get into the bottoms, it's part of, uh, again, the, the uh, Minnesota Valley National Wildlife Refuge. The park's located only uh, about a mile from I-35W and I-90A Street, or <clears throat> 98A Street, so it's right near downtown. Next slide. So the distance from uh, the north end near Old Shakopee Road to the south end on the Minnesota River is about a mile and a half, but it's about a two mile hike just due to the meandering trail. There's about 200 acres of woods in that two mile length, so it's not very wide. Um, yet flowing wild water with Nine Mile Creek and miles and miles of trails, there's paved trails down along the creek, and there's been foot trails up in the woods at the top of the bluff. And speaking of bluffs, we can go to the next slide. There's 40 to 80, 40 to 80 foot bluffs. The 80 foot bluffs are kind of farther south towards the middle. The 40 foot bluffs are towards the north end, not very far from Old Shakopee Road. And you've got mature oaks, you've got maple basswood forest, deer, ducks, owls, coyotes, lots of native wildflowers, and of course, Nine Mile Creek. Next slide. Um, and at the top of that 80 foot bluff, down towards the southern end, you've got prairie, mature oaks. It looks like um, <clears throat> they look like just like. Oak Savanna, because you've got the prairie woodland edge, all kinds of different stuff. Next slide. Um, and at that same prairie, at the top of that 80 foot bluff, you've got the uh, <clears throat> past flower, which is blooming out there right now. Um, you can see the prescri prescribed burn sign that indicates the city and uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service and various other parks authorities help keep this burned. Um, next slide. And then we can back up one. Um, we've got all kinds of wildflowers out there. On the, your left is um, skunk cabbage, which is one of the earliest wildflowers in the spring. It will grow through snow. 
Um, and again, more blood rut. Um, towards the right side, you've got uh, Jack in a pulpit. There's all kinds of different stuff blooming out there. Next slide. Deer, coyotes, mallards, there's woodies, wood ducks out there, Nine Mile Creek. These are all taken right near Nine Mile Creek. Next slide. Oh, you've got owls out there too. You can hear the owls. You can go hike that trail at night. You don't even need a flashlight. Um, and so you can hear the owls out there, then why it's threatened. Um, mostly it's the invasive plants. Uh, the pretty flowers on the upper right, that's garlic mustard. If we don't keep pulling that stuff up and weed whipping it and spraying it, that will be the only flower you would see out there. A common buckthorn in the lower right is everywhere it basically exists in every park in Bloomington. Lines of trails, all kinds of place, things. Um, oak die off happens. Uh, maybe we can go to the next slide uh, because there's a lot of oaks dying and they're not being replaced because they can't compete with this buckthorn and the garlic mustard. Here in the middle, you've got garlic mustard coming up around the skunk cabbage. Um, and again, if you don't pull the garlic mustard out, pretty soon we're not gonna have the skunk cabbage. Again, on the right, you've got that pretty white little dainty flower, the garlic mustard. I hate this stuff. Next slide. Um, here, we've got kind of, if you zoom in, on the left, after I pulled up a bunch of garlic mustard, this was near Nine Mile Creek and near my backyard, it started to look and what was underneath there was an oak seedling and then Jack in the Pulpit seedlings. And then if you look even closer, the little bitty leaves on the left photo and the little bitty leaves on the right photo, again, are garlic mustard growing among the jack in the pulpit. So in order for the native wildflowers to survive, they need a little help from us to get rid of, again, all the garlic mustard. Next slide. On road salt, um, some of you might not know that Nine Mile Creek is in impaired water, according to the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. And if you walk that creek in the spring, just after the snow melt, you will notice these nice little white halos around all of the rocks in the creek, just after the, the spring high water goes down. Those nice white halos are all road salt. It happens every spring. Um, so in the spring breakup, when the ice breaks up, you can go down and see it yourself. Next slide. Um, so what you can do is, again, join us on Saturday for the garlic mustard pull. Go out, pull garlic mustard when you see it yourself. Tell your friends when you're, when you're walking the trails to pull garlic mustard. Um, if you meet people on the trail, you can talk to them about pulling garlic mustard. All of that. And buckthorn. Buckthorn can be pulled out by hand after a rain up until it gets to be about half an inch in diameter. Next slide. So why do this? Um, if you they do a lot of reading, like I do about this stuff, you begin to realize that healthy societies rely on healthy environment. And degraded environments lead to societal decline. Uh, that's true over time as the environment declines, societies often follow, and it's true across space. You can look across the continent where the, where the environments are degraded. There tend to be 
impoverished ecology and impoverished people. Um, so an investment in Bloomington's natural resources is an investment in our natural future and the future vitality of our community. Next slide. So <clears throat> if, if we look at what this is gonna take to beat the buckthorn, the garlic mustard, there's other species following them. They're not the only ones. Um, it's gonna take a cultural transformation where everybody works to restore uh, the natural environment. And uh, one example of that is the Lus Plateau in China. This is an area the size of Texas. They paid the people to restore this, to plant vegetation, to, uh, to basically stop the erosion. It took 20 years, but the ecological communities, the natural vegetation returned and the economy returned to the, the vitality, the wealth of the people also came back with it. And I think that's about all I've got. Um, there may be one more slide or not. Yes, there is. So we get to choose. We can have the savanna and the prairie and the past flowers and the mature oaks on the right, or we can let nature take its course with no more stewardship and all we have is stuff like buckthorn and garlic mustard and wheat canary grass. So I think we're kind of at a crossroads. With that, I'll turn it back to the MCs, Nikki and Tim. Thank you, Rob. Boy, that was um, very educational and uh, very scary at the same time. So thank you for that. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Paul Erdman. Uh, Paul has a degree in conservation and deep experience in water quality, environmental education, invasive species, and ecological restoration. Paul is also a member of the Sustainability Commission and has been very vocal, a very vocal advocate for natural resource conservation. Paul, uh, Paul's belief is that our natural resources will continue to be one of the things that will make Bloomington a great place to live for generations to come, kind of piggybacking on what Rob just said. As we protect our natural resources, we protect us as a community. Paul is going to talk about another very popular resource, Bush Lake. Paul, over to you. Thank you, Tim. Can everybody hear me okay? All right. Yeah, I am uh, proud to serve on the Sustainability Commission. I'm also a member of the Bush Lake chapter of the Isaac Walton League of America. We're a nonprofit conservation organization located on Bush Lake. And the Isaac Walton League has been protecting Bush Lake for over 80 years. So it's an area that is very near and dear to my heart. Next slide, please. So very briefly tonight, I'm going to give you a little bit of history of the area, uh, a little bit about water quality of Bush Lake, the wildlife habitat and wildlife found in the area, some of the threats that face the lake and our area parks, as well as some solutions for protection. Next slide, please. So if we take a look at this map from 1860, maybe one of the first maps made of the area, the area on the lower right that says lake, that's actually Bush Lake. So at one time, Bush Lake was a bay of Anderson's Lake. And now these are separate lakes. So there's Bush Lake and then Southeast Anderson Lake and Northwest Anderson. So they were all connected at one time. The land around these lakes was oak savanna, uh, prairie, and big wood, some areas that Serena and Rob had talked about, um, plus some lakes, ponds, and wetlands mixed in. The Dakota people, as well as other tribes and indigenous people, hunted these lands and fished its waters and used, plants, used the plants found in this area for many purposes, and they likely made their homes or seasonal camps here. 
Later, with European settlement came farms, cabins, and even a few small resorts. Later still, Bloomington became a township, a village, and then a city. And with that came residential and other development. Next slide, please. So this is a literal bird's eye view, uh, iron bird's eye view of Bush Lake looking from north to south. That's Highland Lake at the very top of the screen. So you can see that there's still a lot of area that's protected, that's in parkland. There's some prairie there and some woodlands and uh, residential areas as well. Next slide. Today, this area, Bush Lake, is part of Highland Bush Anderson Lakes Park Reserve, which is part of the Twin Cities Metropolitan Regional Park System. This entire area encompasses about 2,600 acres. And when I'm outside walking these areas, looking for plants and wildlife, I, I feel fortunate that some people were wise enough a long time ago to say, to recognize this resource and say, these areas deserve protection, let's make them parks. Next slide, please. The Bush Lake Beach is one of the most popular beaches in the state with over 100,000 visitors per year. That's probably largely due to the great water quality that I'm gonna talk about shortly. There's all kinds of recreation that can be had on the lake any time of the year. And there's just a, a long list, but parks that surround the lake as well as things that you can imagine that you can do in a lake can be done in this area. Next slide, please. Bush Lake does have excellent water quality. It regularly gets A and B grades from the Met Council and Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. This is really great, especially for a metro area lake. <clears throat> it has excellent water clarity. My wife Elizabeth and I go out about every 10 days <clears throat> when the ice isn't on the lake and do the water quality samples for the Nine Mile Creek Watershed District. So we take a secchi disc and throw it outside the canoe and however far down we can see that disc in the water is the, the clarity reading. And our record is 17 feet. We could see that disc down in the water and the average is about 10 feet. So really great, clean, clear water. And the reasons for this are a few reasons. So it's surrounded by parkland. So there's not a lot of turf grass lawns that are contributing pesticides or fertilizers or other stormwater runoff into the lake. Um, so again, wise people at one point said, we're gonna only allow six horsepower boats on Bush Lake. So there's not big, huge motor boats ripping across the lake, creating wakes and uh, causing erosion on the shoreline. And so that's also great for paddlers on canoes. Another reason why the lake is so clean and clear is because of its sandy bottom, how it was formed and its rocky bottom. Just a few quick other facts about Bush Lake. It's not a very deep lake at about 28 feet deep. It's 170 acres and all kinds of fish can be found on Bush Lake. Uh, most people here fish for largemouth bass. You might occasionally find a tiger muskie still in the lake. Next slide, please. And one more slide, please. There's just an arrow here that comes across. So Bush Lake uh, is in this conservation corridor. And so these corridors are really critical in our metro areas to connect our parks for wildlife and wildlife habitat. So we have Anderson Lakes and Tierney's Woods to the Northwest, Nine Mile Creek and Normandale Lake to the Northeast, Richardson Nature Center and Highland Park to the East. And then of course, the Minnesota River Valley National Wildlife Refuge that we all just heard about uh, just a few miles to the South. Next slide, please. So all of these areas are connected and it allows us to have a great diversity of wildlife in the area from reptiles and amphibians to like the frog you see, uh, the barred owl that Rob mentioned earlier, Trumpeter swans we see pretty regularly on the lake. And then in the lower right, I encourage you in June to 
head out to Bush Lake or Highland Park and find a marshy area at dusk and sit there and watch all of the fireflies. There will be mosquitoes out too, so you want to put some bug spray on. But it's really amazing all the fireflies that we see. And that's a good sign because it's an excellent uh, indicator of environmental health. Next slide, please. So just some other shots, uh, wood ducks, turtles on a log raft. Uh, we do have beavers in the area and a tree frog on an echinacea flower. Next slide. Uh, beautiful plant life, uh, native plants in the area, uh, pollinators. And here's a, a flock of geese that picture was taken in the fall uh, with a full moon. Next slide, please. It's a resource worth protecting because we have some unique rare and threatened species found in the area. Um, I could give you some examples here. The top one on the left is called bladderwort. That is an aquatic plant uh, that can inflate those air sacs that's under a microscope and it inflates those air sacs to float to the top. And some people think that it's a carnivorous plant and it catches little microorganisms in those bladders. Uh, the middle plant is a plant that's near and dear to my heart. That one is called kitten tails. And that is a savanna obligate plant. So we've been hearing about oak savannas tonight. And it's threatened because, like Serena said, we don't have very many oak, and oak savannas left anymore. Next slide, please. Uh, rusty patch bumblebees, an endangered species of bee, have been found around Bush Lake. Next slide. We've also seen redheaded woodpeckers. You see that on the left. These used to be much more abundant. And I believe Serena mentioned them. They also love oak savanna habitat. But we've been lucky to see a few around here. Uh, prairie skinks used to be what very much more common, but we do still see them. Monarchs, as we know, are um, having a tough time, but we see lots of monarchs. And we have loons on Bush Lake. Um, we don't think that they nest here, but we see and hear them pretty regularly. They like that clear water. Next slide, please. A really cool plant that I love a lot is called American Lotus. Uh, a lot of people think this is just white water lily, but it isn't. It's um, those big flowers that you see there are actually our largest blooms of any native plant in Minnesota. And if you go to the south end of the lake, you can find a patch of this American lotus. And there's also a patch. The top picture there is from Highland Park. Next slide, please. So all of these things can be threatened. Um, and I'll be blunt. Uh, people, we, we can be really smart, but we can also do some really dumb things. Uh, we're the ones that brought buckthorn here. We're the ones that brought garlic mustard here that Rob was talking about. So we should take a little bit of responsibility in managing it and getting rid of that before it uh, pushes out all of these wonderful, diverse native plants and native wildlife. Um, there's buckthorn on the left. We also have Eurasian water milfoil that was brought by people and threatens the aquatic environment in the lake. People use lead fishing tackle and sometimes will lose that lead tackle, which falls to the bottom of the lake. And loons and trumpeter swans and other waterfowl mistake that for rocks that they use to chew up their stuff. And they can die from eating one little lead sinker. Uh, East Bush Lake Roads has some of the highest turtle mortality of any road in the state. And so we've worked to put up these turtle crossing signs in the area to try to get people to slow down. Climate change, of course, and increased storm events. Um, dumb stuff, just an example. I went to the woods across uh, on the west side of Bush Lake last weekend, and somebody thought it would be a good idea to plant non-native crocus right in the middle of our public woods. And people also steal plants. And plastic pollution. Some people think it's a good idea to take their Christmas decorations and decorate our public woods with them. So that stuff breaks apart, goes into the environment, and can hurt and harm wildlife. 
Next slide, please. But of course, the other end of that, the solutions to that is people too. Uh, we, you've already heard it tonight, but you can volunteer. Adopt a park by contacting the city or Three Rivers Park District, Hennepin County, or working with nonprofits like the Isaac Walton League. Uh, become educated and educate others. Participate in citizen science uh, like the iNaturalist. I don't know if any of you have heard of iNaturalist, but it's really cool. I would check it out. Uh, advocate for habitat and restoration. And remember not to get burnt out and enjoy the good stuff. Next slide, please. Uh, everybody, if you have uh, storm drains in your neighborhoods, can protect the water bodies in their neighborhood by adopting a storm drain. Uh, you just go to that website and clean it out a couple times a year. Uh, you can pick up litter and please don't let your dog poop all over. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just a couple of ways to uh, other ways you can help before I wrap up. Uh, get kids and others outside. Uh, we're, we only want to protect the things that we know about and that we're aware of. So it's important to teach the kids about all these cool things in nature. Visit parks and open spaces. And in your own yards, you can provide wildlife habitat. You can plant native plants, remove invasive plants, say no to neonic pesticides and limit and avoid pesticide use. Next slide, please. If each of us does a little bit, it can make a big difference. That is a shot of the prairie on the other side of the lake. Next slide. And so with that, I just wanna thank my fellow sustainability commissioners, the mayor, and city council and city staff, Nine Mile Creek Watershed District for all of their efforts in protecting Bush Lake and the area and other parks. Um, also, thank you all for attending and thanks to all the residents of Bloomington for putting natural resources at the top of your priorities. I do have two bonus slides, Tim and Ellen, if I have time. Go for it. Oh, I guess they got cut off. <laughs> that's okay i don't know if those made it in paul <laughs> that's okay that's okay we'll save those for another time <laughs> thank you all all right paul thank you uh boy what a what a great story uh about um about that lake in that area you know so many great things to see and so many opportunities that uh, for us to help protect it. So yes, thank you. That, that was great, Paul. So our last speaker tonight, last but not least, is uh, Mark Morrison. Uh, Mark has been the recreation supervisor for uh, Bloomington Parks and Recreation since uh, 2003, after an earlier career working in archaeology and museums. He has a wide range of responsibilities within parks and recreation, including the supervision of the Bloomington Farmers Market, art, Arts in the Parks, a large history program, special events, and special projects in the management of Bloomington's natural, resor natural resources. Uh, and so Mark is going to talk about a hidden treasure in the Minnesota uh, River Valley. So, Mark, tell us about the Pond Dakota and Parker's Picnic Ground area. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Tim, and thanks uh, to everybody for having me. Um, man, what interesting speakers we've had so far. Well, first of all, can everybody hear me okay? We good? Okay. Yep. Good. Um, interesting speaker so far, just a wealth of good information and tough acts to follow for sure, but um, I just wanted to talk about, give a little bit of the kind of the history of some of our projects, particularly in the Minnesota River Valley and how we kind of got started on um, the restoration work that's been kind of ongoing for, for more than a decade now, actually, back in, um, in areas in the bluff and down, down into the valley and some of the Bloomington owned um, Minnesota River Valley lands. And to start off with that, I'm gonna give a little bit I'm going to be focusing on Pond Dakota Mission Park and Parker's uh, Picnic Grounds area, which is just adjacent, just to the east of Pond Dakota. But um, 
a little bit of a history background is kind of important. So I wanted to kick off with that because it kind of relates to how we got kind of got started on um, doing a lot of these projects. So Pond Dakota Mission Park, which is located between Nicollet and Portland Avenues on 104th Street, is near the location uh, in the Minnesota River Valley where, where um, prior to white settlement, the Dakota people had actually two villages. One was near the mouth of Nine Mile Creek, and it was kind of an earlier village. And another later one was formed um, by Chief Cloudman near the site of today's uh, where Pond Dakota Mission Park resides today. So Cloudman's people had previously lived in the Minneapolis area in the Bede Makaska area, formerly Lake Calhoun in Minneapolis, but later moved to the Minnesota River Valley. So uh, fast forward a little bit, Gideon and Samuel Pond are two brothers that came west into Minnesota territory in 1834 um, to become missionaries to the Dakota Indians, which they did uh, run a mission or a couple of couple of missions actually Samuel ended up running a separate mission but Gideon um, set up the Oak Grove mission in 1843 and they were actually missionaries until about 1852 after the Treaty of Traverse de Sioux which was in 1851 kind of relocated um, Dakota people to reservation lands farther west on the Minnesota River so but for a while for that pe time period there was a mission located at the current location of Pond Dakota Mission Park. So now after several generations of Pond family ownership um, in that area, the city of Bloomington obtained the park, the land, the 40, approximate 40 acres up on top of the bluff, and also the Gideon and Agnes Pond House, which was shown in a slide earlier when we were doing one of, I think it was the first um, of, the, uh, of the activities we had, had a shot of the Pond House on. Um, and the city obtained the land back in the 1980s and turned it into a park. So for the past 20 years, this city has conducted historical programs at Pond Dakota Mission Park featuring subjects including the history of the Dakota, uh, Pond family history and Gideon Pond history, and many programs dealing with kind of the early history of Bloomington and the state of Minnesota because the, Pond Dakota, the uh, Gideon and Agnes Pond House incidentally is one of the oldest remaining houses in the state built 1856. Not many houses um, exist from that time period in the state actually anymore. But one of the things that was always missing from the historical interpretation at that site and the work that we're doing was giving people a good idea of what the landscape would have looked like and been like at the time when the Dakota were, were there 170 years ago and earlier. Prior to the, white, the impact of white settlement in the area essentially with agriculture and other activities. So, the city has had, um, the city's done a lot of high quality prairie establishments all around the city actually. There's pockets of prairie all over the place. And they've been doing kind of an establishment and maintenance program for decades. Um, good example is out at uh, West Bush Lake Park. We saw um, a slide in the last presentation for, um, from the big prairie area that's out there. That's just one of many, many examples that actually exist in the city. But in 2010, we decided to get more focused on some specific projects that would make, can make a bigger impact um, in some of the city's most important natural areas with the Minnesota River Valley being probably the, the foremost of those. So in 2009 um, and 10, it was decided to undertake kind of an, an interesting five acre restoration project at Pond Dakota Mission Park. Um, the purpose of that project was to kind of in a sense, turn back the clock on a section of that bluff top land at the park and bring it back to its native state or something similar to that, to what it would have been like 170 years ago. And so this would, would be creating, the goal of this was to create an area where we could better interpret both the history and the natural history of the park and the river valley, but also to help obviously reestablish an important natural ecosystem in the area, one that really ought to be in that area. So to, uh, to undertake this project, the city allocated money back in 2010 for um, natural resource restorations to restore areas such as Pond Dakota. And the city for that project contracted with a company called Great River Greening, which many people have probably heard of. They actually are a nonprofit that does a lot of similar projects um, all around the state and they do a lot of really good work. And they're one of the cool things about Great River Greening and which we benefited from as a city 
was they supplied a portion of the funding for that project through grant fundings from the state and federal governments that they received. And then they can then um, plow some of those funds into projects when working with cities and counties and such. So that particular project involved um, de literally deforesting about five acres of bluff top land, but it was primarily box elder, tons and tons of buckthorn, essentially a buckthorn forest, a lot of black locust, um, diseased ash trees, things like that. A lot of just undesirable stuff, but left all the oak trees that were in place. And then once the area was open, reseeded it and also added a lot of plugs all around of, um, of a wide variety of tall grass prairie plants and flowers. And then, um, and then as part of the contract, conducted maintenance for the next two years following the seeding. And then after, thereafter, city crews took over the maintenance of that site, um, you know, beginning in about two, um, 2012, where we, we do regularly scheduled burns, mowing. We also conduct a lot of invasive species removal events um, at that park and at other places around the city, but that's been kind of one of the major parks that we've tried to see what, what happens when you actually try to maintain a place that, um, that you've done a full restoration of, and so, so far so good. Um, as a result of this project, 10 years now, actually about 12 years after the restoration began, um, the Pond Dakota Prairie and the Prairie area has become well established and contains a wide variety of really high quality native plant species. Um, it's, the area is now has become that five acres and actually beyond now has become the important ecosystem that it once was and is an example of what can be done when you are able to throw sufficient resources at a project um, and have buy in from the public and volunteer events and, and things like that. And has become an important centerpiece of historical and our important and growing Dakota based programming that we do at the park. And that's going to be, that's becoming a bigger and bigger emphasis all the time, telling the Dakota story of their life in the Minnesota River Valley. So the Pond Dakota Restoration was, the, was a project that started, was the project that really started all the rest of the efforts that the city has done in the Minnesota River Valley with many other restoration projects, um, including among these are 20 acres that are to the west of Pond Dakota going towards um, Hopkins Road, nearly 20 acres between Pond Dakota and, and Parker's Picnic Grounds to the east, and also the current 20 acre Parker's Picnic Area project, which is, on, which is happening right now. Um, we have a contractor working on it and that is being funded by, in large part by a um, state of Minnesota legacy grant that was obtained by the Sustainability Commission. So nice job on that. It's paying for a, a giant chunk of that project with the city also supplying um, city funds to make up the balance for doing that project. And then another great example is the, is the wonderful Ikes Creek project that was another city partnership project with Great River Greening um, some years ago and the restoration of that great trout stream that we heard about earlier and then also of course Fish and Wildlife Service an important partner on that project as well. So all, the, the cool thing about this though is that all of these projects except for Ike's which is a little bit farther east um, link up to each other and are essentially creating kind of one large major restoration area in the river valley. They all touch each other Ultimately, it'd be nice to restore much more of the city's river valley land back to its natural state. And that is a goal that um, as part of the plan, we'd like to do as much of that as possible. And we think we're off to a pretty nice start with um, really under so far, um, at least 50 acres of river valley land have been restored back to, to a more traditional and native state as they should be. And again, looking to continue that work more in the future. So, um, as we've done, as, it, as has been mentioned, we have the garlic mustard pool coming up at uh, Parker's Picnic Grounds this Saturday, and we'd love to have you come out and visit both Pond Dakota Mission Park and Parker's Picnic Grounds. They're right next door to each other, easy to get to. And come on out and visit um, those places in the near future. And as you walk the upper trail in the Minnesota River Valley, there's kind of the lower trail by the river, but then there's also an upper trail, which takes you through um, Pond Dakota and, um, Parkers and places farther west, you can get a really good feel for these projects that I'm talking about because they go um, adjacent to that upper trail. So, with that, I'm just going to leave it with that. And uh, thanks for your uh, thanks for your time tonight. 
Thanks, Mark. That was a great presentation. And uh, man, I just, you know, I see these, I see all these different presentations. I just want to get out there and see them and help out and, and that sort of thing. It's just great. And it's just so wonderful to learn about these great spaces and what we can do to help protect them. Um, and so, you know, now that we've learned about some of these fantastic places in our midst, we'd like to, as Mark was just saying, we'd like to invite you to get out and take some action to help preserve them. Uh, starting this Saturday, uh, as uh, a couple of people mentioned, the Sustainability Commission is hosting a garlic mustard poll this Saturday. And uh, as Rob was pointing out, garlic mustard is a pretty nasty invasive species and uh, we really need to control it as much as we can. So the Sustainability Commission is inviting you to join us to help eradicate garlic mustard in the Parker's Fifty Ground uh, area, which is, as Mark mentioned, has been an area of, uh, has a focus of respiration over the last few years. So we'll be meeting at Parker's Picnic Ground uh, parking lot, which is located at uh, 10401 Columbus Road at 1 o'clock p.m. Uh, we will supply all the implements uh, and provide guidance on how to identify and pull garlic mustard. Uh, we'll also, uh, we might also uh, take some uh, buckthorn out as well, and uh, we'll keep pulling until 3 o'clock or until we run out of garlic mustard. So uh, please come and join us. Uh, wear clothing that's appropriate for gardening, and uh, please uh, come with a face mask. Uh, and so for more information and to sign up so we know how many pullers to prepare for, go to the Sustainability Commission's website, and it's right there on your screen at the bottom, blm.mn slash sustainability. And also on the screen, you'll see if you're not interested in uh, pulling garlic mustard, the National Wildlife Refuge uh, is having a bass uh, ponds uh, cleanup. And the Bloomington Middle School uh, Environmental Peace Club is also uh, doing a cleanup of uh, Tarnhill uh, Park Playground. So multiple opportunities to get out and uh, get involved in, in helping to do some, some cleanup and and some uh, good work. So finally, to wrap up our session tonight, if we are serious about what Earth Day stands for, we really need to make every day an Earth Day. So how do we do that? So the Sustainability Commission has identified a number of actions that you can take anytime to help keep our environment strong and healthy and enable you to take the spirit of Earth Day with you all year round. And you can find that list on the Sustainability Commission's website page, again, uh, blm.mn slash sustainability. So that concludes our program this evening. We hope that you will register and join us on Saturday uh, at, the, at the Garlic Mustard Pool at Parker's Picnic Ground. And let's make every day an Earth Day. Good night, Bloomington. Good night, all. Thank you. Thank you.